Hi everyone, and welcome to my talk about functional programming in Kotlin, where we explore the Arrow framework. First, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Thies van der Ven. I'm from the Netherlands, um, and working for a company called JDriven, and I'm quite proud to call myself a software engineer, because I'm actually quite passionate about the engineering part of software engineering. And with engineering part, I mean the higher level concepts, higher level abstractions, the fundamentals of it, and just the general problem solving aspect of it. And because I'm very passionate about the engineering part, I love to talk about it. So you may think I came all the way here from the Netherlands to just so you can learn something about cutting and functional programming. In practice, I just get to talk about my favorite subject for about 60 minutes, and it's kind of rude to interrupt. On that note, my friends and family would like to thank you for finally getting a break from all that. <laughs> um, I have 60 minutes. Um, I should have a bit of time. If you have questions in between, we can try to answer that. Didn't do that before. We can see how that goes. I wasn't always an engineer. Uh, in the beginning of my career, I worked on this big monolithic application. And with big monolithic application, I mean like millions of lines of code. And with millions of lines of code comes a lot of complexity. And with a lot of complexity comes a lot of bugs. So in practice, most of my days there, I was just solving bugs and introducing a few here and there. But if you're solving bugs for a few years, a few things start to happen. First of all, you start to see certain patterns between bugs, as in, hey, these are basically the same bugs. Secondly, there's a sort of quest you start to get on into how can I prevent these bugs from even occurring. So instead of solving them, preventing them, that's uh, something I kind of like to do. And lastly, you decide to switch companies because you don't want to fix bugs all the time, and that's how I ended up at JDriven. And in my quest to find uh, ways to prevent these bugs from happening, I kind of came across functional programming. Because functional programming is officially a bit closer to mathematics and therefore more into the fundamentals of software engineering. So there I'm slowly learning why certain things happen. And I think it's important to note here, I didn't come to functional programming from an academic perspective. I came to it through a practical need. And if there's one thing I would really like to advocate here, you don't need any mathematics to go into functional programming. Just a bit of an interest in wanting to know why certain things work. So myself, zero mathematics, and I'm still learning the mathematics, I'm actively doing that, uh, but you don't need any to look into this subject. So what will we talk to, uh, about today? We're going to do a little bit of functional programming theory. We're going to talk about monads, everybody's favorite subject. Uh, we're going to see how we can adapt those in a real-world application. And we're going to finish off talking about some optics and some smart types, just some cool stuff that Arrow can do for you. So let's talk functional programming. And a good place to start is the question, what is functional programming? Very difficult, difficult question to answer, since basically everyone will give you a slightly different answer to that. Uh, my answer to that changes over time as well. And right now, I think functional programming is a story about love. It's about loving your compiler. Because within functional programming, he tried to take as many runtime issues and move them to compile time. As in, in an ideal world, the moment you start doing stupid stuff, your program will just not compile. So you won't get any runtime errors because your compiler won't allow you to reach that state. It's about loving your team members and, to a certain extent, your future self by being very explicit. Basically, we're trying to make code do what it says. That may sound like, yeah, that's obvious, but we'll see a bit later examples of, uh, of that where that might not be the case. It's about loving some cake. More on that later. And of course, about loving your functions, because it's functional programming. So let's start with functions. And most importantly, function signatures. So function signatures are derived from the input and the output of a function. So it's just a different way to write down a function. 
So in this case, we have a function foo that takes a string and produces an int. So its function signature is given a string, produce an int. And if we even abstract it a bit more, given an A, produce a B. And you might think, yeah, that's every function ever, and that could, would be true. But what about error handling? What if your function cannot return a B for whatever reason? Because when an error occurs, we means we are in an invalid state, we need to somehow short circuit, stop executing until we either recover from it or uh, the program will just crash. Now, Kotlin has three different ways to handle errors. By the way, anyone not really that familiar with Kotlin here? Everybody in Kotlin expert? I'll go into a few things of Kotlin just to be sure. So we have runtime exceptions, the Kotlin's nullability system, and the result type. Uh, the observant people will notice a bit of an asterisk at the result type. Uh, I'm not going very deep into that, but I will mention it a bit later. So first, let's talk ex runtime exceptions. So we have our classic divide problem that takes two doubles and produces a double. So the function signature is given two doubles, produce a double. But of course, if b is zero, then division by zero, and mathemat mathematicians still haven't figured out what, uh, what needs to happen then. So we can't do that, so we throw an exception. So again, the function signature is given two doubles, produce a double. The behavior of the function is given two doubles, I either produce a double or I kill your current threat, which is quite extreme in my opinion. And not only that, the only reason that we know of this behavior is because I took the time and effort to write a bit of Java doc on top of the function. And of course, you all write Java doc like this on all your functions. And of course, you read the Java doc of every function you're calling, but you might have a teammate somewhere that might not always do one of those two things. So this is actually quite a dangerous pattern because the function signature says one thing, but the behavior is something else. And like I said in the beginning, we like to be explicit about our behavior. So let's look at Kotlin's notability system. Uh, Kotlin's notability system allows us um, to write it like this, where our function signature is given to doubles, produce a double, question mark. And within Kotlin, this means that that double is nullable which also means that the first two doubles didn't have a question mark. They have to be guaranteed to be non-null. And just if b is zero, we return null, or else we return the correct uh, result. In Java, this is a bad solution. However, in Kotlin, because null is so fine-grained in integrated into the type system, that Kotlin won't allow you to operate do operations on nullable values, unless you do a specific check-in in between. And that, because of that, this is actually a good solution in Kotlin. Because in Kotlin, if we call a divide function, since it's nullable, we can now, using the question mark dot uh, annotation, we only call the next function if the previous value was non-null. So basically, if the previous value succeeded, execute this function, otherwise do nothing. And we can keep on chaining that, as in, oh, if the previous thing succeeded, then call this function, otherwise do nothing. And in the end, we have this, what we call the Elvis operator, because if you turn it sideways, you have this nice hair, uh, hair and such. Beca that one basically says, if the previous statement is null, use this default instead. So out of this thing, either comes the correct result, or 0.0, .0 if anything went wrong. So these are the two possibilities within Kotlin. And the difference between them is this one, the function isn't honest, but if it goes wrong, at least we know why, because we get a nice error message that we cannot divide by zero. So we have a dishonest function signature, but if it goes wrong, at least we know exactly why it went wrong. Nullability system has an honest signature. It can go wrong, it can return null, but we don't really know why it returned null. For example, in a database call, does, did the no results come back? 
did an error occur, we just don't know. So one solution has an error context, uh, so we know what went wrong, and the other one has error as a return value, so we know that it can go wrong. And to be honest, I kind of want to have my cake and eat it too. I would like to have both an error context and I want error as a return type. And in looking into this, that's when I encountered the Arrow framework. The Arrow is a functional programming library uh, made for Kotlin. It's still relatively new. Its 1.0 release was September last year. Uh, it contains things like monads, uh, some improvements to coroutines, some optics and some metaprogramming. And recently I also added amazing support because I'm also part of that Slack channel. Uh, at some point I, I did a post where, hmm, this behavior is kind of odd. I can make it work, but the behavior is kind of odd. I think it was like three or four minutes before someone just typed, oh, that's a bug. And before I finished typing, okay, no worries, I'll make an issue then. He already posted an issue link. And two hours later, uh, the issue was, was closed, it was solved. So the support, the community around it is really amazing and very helpful. So credit for them. So let's talk about monads and specifically the IDA monad. Well, since monads are a bit scary, uh, let me try to demystify them a bit, what they mean in practice. Because like I said, I'm not good at mathematics yet, but I'm good at the practical use cases of it. So a monad in a practical use case is basically just a wrapper. It's a wrapper around a return value. Because the function, for one reason or another, couldn't return that value at that point in time. For example, the function could have failed, or in case of a future, maybe that's more familiar, that's also a monad, the function couldn't return a value at that specific point in time, but it wants to return something now. So it basically returns a wrapper that can deal with the fact that the value is not, uh, not yet there. So for practical purpose, a monad is just a wrapper. And an either is what we call, so an error monad, and a right-based monad, which means it has two generic types. It has a left generic type and a right generic type. The left generic type is meant to say uh, the type of the error context. So if our error is supposed to be a string, the left type would be a string. If we want it to be a throwable, it is a throwable and such. And the right generic type is the actual value that we're interested in. To remember which one is which, it's just easy, right is right. And if you're now thinking, well, this whole left-right thing, that's a bit weird naming convention, a lot of people think that, but it's the standard, Arrow didn't make this up, this is what every language uses, so we just have to deal with it. It's also important to see how an either is implemented, because it's implemented as a sealed class. So you will never get an instance of either, you will get an instance of the left class, or an instance of the right class. And this is important because this means that if you get back an either, it cannot be both. It's either an instance of left containing an error or an instance of right containing the value you're interested in. And because it's a sealed class, these are the only two possible implementations of either. And we'll see why that's important a bit later. So now we know what an either is, let's create one. Um, we go back to our divide function, and we now see that our function signature is given to doubles. I either return an instance of left containing a string, or an instance of right containing a double. And we can see that, that if b is zero, we return a new instance of left, Kotlin doesn't need a new keyword, and otherwise we return a new instance of right containing the actual value. Of course, it's Kotlin, and Kotlin is amazing. We can make this shorter because Kotlin has something called extension functions that add functionality to existing objects. So we can also just call dot left on dot right on every object we have to turn it into an either of that type. If you now think, nah, this is still a bit too much work for me, arrow got you covered, you can also just do either dot catch. And it basically puts a try catch around it. And if, it's, uh, if it throws an error, it returns an instance of left containing that throwable. We can also now see that the uh, uh, function signature has changed, that the left is now a throwable. And the more observant of you might see that asterisk back again. This is what Kotlin's result type does. 
it's basically an either with on the left side a throwable and on the right side the value you're interested in. So if that's all you need, I would suggest just using Kotlin's default result type. Uh, if you want to have more control of the error context, then you kind of need to move to either's. If you don't want a throwable on the left side, we can of course change that by uh, calling top map left. And now we can, for example, change our left value back into a string. And of course, this function will only execute if it's an instance of either.left. If it's an instance of either.right, this function will just do nothing. If you can transform the left value, we can, of course, also transform the right value, for which we can use map. And again, this function only gets executed if it's an instance of right, if you're on the happy flow. Otherwise, this function will do nothing. So now we know how to create an either, but at some point we need to get the value back out of the either. So we, co we call it a void function. So in my either variable is either an instance of left containing a string or an instance of right containing a double. Well, one thing we could do is just call or null. Just if it's an instance of left, give me null. Otherwise, give me the value you're interested in. You can also see the function uh, what comes back is a, a double question mark because it's now nullable. We can do a get or else. If it's an instance of right, give me the value. If it's an instance of left, just give me this default value. But if you use one of these two, you're actually not using the error context, which is the whole point of an either. You might as well just use Cotton's nullability system, which I would then advise to do that. So if you actually want to do something with the left value, one thing we can do is pattern match over it. When is basically Java switch statement. And because it's a sealed class, uh, we don't need a default branch here. Because the compiler knows that the only two possible implementations are either.left and either.right. The is is basically uh, Kotlin's instance of check. And Kotlin is even more awesome because after the arrow, it already checked that it's an instance of either.left. So it automatically casts that variable to an instance of either.left. So my either.value here is a string because that was the type of the left value. Same thing with right, because it already did the, cast, uh, the check and already did the cast, my either the value there is a double. So we can do times two or, or something on it. And lastly, we have a get or handle where we try to recover from the error. As in, okay, I'm a left now, but I'm going to try to turn it into a right. So out of this function must come a double. Well, in our particular case, I can't really turn a string into a double, uh, so I just lock the error and return 0.0. .0. But we can basically recover from the error. And this is basically um, using map and such, we come back to chaining in a happy flow again. And this is very similar to what we just saw with Cotton's nullability system. I even put them on, uh, on, oh, yeah, above each other where if we create, if we call divide, we can now map over it that only gets executed if the previous operation went correctly. We can flap map over it, which is exactly the same as map, but if the function returns an either, you should use flap map, otherwise you should use map. And in the end, do a get or else to give a default value. So this is a very powerful pattern in both nullability system as working with monads because we don't have to think about the error conditions until the very last moment. Up until then, we can just think in happy flow. What if I assume the previous thing went correct? And you can create really beautiful code with that because you don't have to do any error flows in your business logic that way. You can handle all of that in the end. So. It's nice talking about this in theory, but how would this look in practice? I made a bit of a pseudo Spring Boot application uh, to demonstrate this. We'll first build one without IDRS and then see what we adding IDRS will do for us. So our demo application will uh, try to get a speaker and a conference and make a booking for that speaker on that conference. So we have a speaker repository, gets a speaker, a conference repository, gets a conference. A booking is just a combination of speaker and conference, and that thing will store it. So 
not going to implement it, assume that as, that will be correct. Here we have a service which gets a speaker from the speaker conference, gets a conference from the co uh, from the conference repository, creates a booking, and stores the booking. And our controller will probably look a bit like this, which just calls the service to create a booking and gives back HTTP 200 that with the booking ID. So this will probably work, but what about errors? A lot of things can fail here. Database connection can fail. What if a speaker couldn't be found? What if a conference couldn't be found? There are quite a few things that can go wrong in that code. So one thing we could do is just add a try catch, maybe include a not found domain exception that your repository can throw. And in that case, just return a 404 and otherwise we'll just throw an internal server error. And this will work, but let's see what happens if we add IDOS to the mix. And before we're adding those IDOS, we'll start by introducing the left side. So what's the type for the left side of the IDA? And I also like to use a sealed class for that. And why, why that is, we'll discover in a bit. But we could define the domain exceptions here, that it's an either not found, or it's just a general exception, like a database connection field or something. Now we refactor our repositories, so it now returns either that are either an instance of bad state, so one of those two classes, or the correct value. Now I'm going to skip the service for a bit and go sta straight to the controller. It's a lot of codes, don't worry, we'll go through it one by one. So first we create a booking, which returns an either, which is either instance of bad state or a long containing the booking ID. First, we pattern match over it again, and if it's an instance of write, okay, everything went okay, just return at HTTP 200 with the correct value. Otherwise, we can now pattern match over the bad state, because that's also a sealed class. And if it's a not found, we do a 404, and otherwise we give back a 500. And you might think, oh, this actually looks quite similar to the try-catch. But there's a big difference between the solution and the previous solution. Previously, we had to remember to add a try-catch. The first uh, version of our application perfectly compiled. But then we discovered a lot of things can go wrong. Because I'm using IDAs here, in order to get a value back out from an IDA, I'm forced to make a decision on what needs to happen if that value is not there. Do I give a default value? Do I throw an exception anyway? At least now it becomes a conscious decision you're making. And I'm forced to make the decision. It's impossible for me to create code that do where I'm not uh, making that decision. And I think that's a very good thing. Same with the domain exceptions. If in the future, we, for example, add a duplicate booking exception, in our try-catch example, I needed to actually remember to add that cause to the, to the catch block. Because I used the sealed class for that as well, this code will no longer compile because this when is not exhaustive. It's missing one, uh, one operation. So again, I'm forced to deal with all possible, uh, possible errors. And this is again a bit in the theme of the functional programming. Let's move as many errors from runtime and move them to compile time. You can't compile a program anymore if, unless you dealt with all possible error paths. You can still, of course, opt out to a lot of things and such, but again, that's a conscious decision you're making there, instead of it being the default. There's one downside, however, um, and that's in the surface, because to create a booking, we need actual values. And the speaker repository and the conference repository now return IDERs. So we kind of need to do some flat map magic to create a booking. And this can get quite ugly at some point. As in, you can get quite deeply nested code here. And yeah, that's kind of an issue because on the one hand, I love this compile time checking. And on the other hand, I like to write nice imperative code. I kind of want to have my cake and eat it too. So maybe Arrow can help us with that. Spoiler, of course it can, because I'm talking about it. 
And it does that with my Yitro favorite feature of Arrow, the monad comprehensions. And it allows us to work with monads and still do imperative style programming. And all we have to do for that is just add an IDA block like this. And if within this block we just define an IDA, it now gets the dot bind method, which basically does, if it's an instance of write, we just get the result out of it and put it in that variable. If it's an instance of left, we immediately short circuit and now return that left from this function. So that means that if we come to this statement, everything went correct, we're still in the happy path. We can only get to this statement if the previous step went correctly. And we can then just return it. You can also maybe see that this function is suspended because this uh, uses the Kotlin coroutines framework underneath to do this short circuiting. If you don't want your function to be suspended, you can just use either.eager and then you don't need uh, coroutines. So it kind of depends if you're using coroutines, just do the previous. If you don't do that, just use either.eager. So how will our code look like once we add that? So we don't use coroutines here, so we do an either.eager. Now we're all back to getting a speaker from the speaker repository, call dot bind. If the next uh, if this went correctly, we go to the conference repository, call dot bind. And if those two calls went correctly, now we can create a booking and now we can store the booking. So we're basically back to our old imperative style programming, but we now get all this compile time safety that I just provide. And that's why this is my favorite feature. I wrote basically my most beautiful code ever using this system, where I had this nice business logic that was just all happy path and all the way in the end, I now needed to do some pattern matching. So, oh yeah, what if this happens? What if this happens and such. But my happy flow, my happy business path was just fully, fully uh, bad path free. So what did we learn? Um, we can have compile time safety in using IDERS and we can still do imperative programming thanks to the either comprehension. Well, that was basically the stuff that you can use tomorrow in your project. Uh, Arrow also has just some really just cool stuff that I wanted to show off. One of them being optics. And immutability is a very good pattern. Um, I don't really have the time to go all the way into that, but if you disagree, then please come to me after this talk. And Kotlin supports this very well with its data classes. So to give a bit of an example, uh, let's make some data classes. We'll create a person, which has a name and a city. We'll create a city, which has a street name and a street. And we'll create a street, which just has a name. Now Kotlin supports the immutability pattern very well because it has a copy method, where if you want to change the person's name, we can just call that copy on it and say, okay, give me a full copy of this object, but just change the name for me. And that will work. So awesome feature of Kotlin. However, how would it look like if I wanted to change the street's name? Now it gets a bit more ugly because now we could have to call person.copy, set the city property. Now we have to call person.city.copy, set the street property. And now we have to call person.city.street.copy and now we can set the street name. So immutability is awesome. Having deeply nested immutable objects gives you this. If only there was a way uh, that could make this a bit get cubism. If only I could have immutability and ease of state transitions. If only I could eat my, have my cake and eat it too. Of course, arrow for this is to the rescue and it offers the lens class. And a lens is just a class that looks into a specific property or attribute of another object. So basically we are creating a class that for in this case, given a person, we zoom in on just the city property of that person and define a getter and a setter for that particular property. So we can then use the city lens to either get the city given a person or modify the city given a person. Again, right now, this is not that useful because we could have just done this with a copy. 
method. The power comes when we start creating more lenses. So if we create a lens that goes from the city object to its street property, and from the street object to the street names property, we can now compose these lenses. So we create a lens that goes from person to city, from city to street, and from street to street name. So together, that makes a lens that goes all the way from the person prop uh, object to the street name property. And now we can use this lens to instantly modify the street name. Now you might be thinking, yeah, that sounds actually quite useful, but all this stuff looks like a lot more work than just doing that one copy in that one place. And you would be correct. Luckily, Arrow can just generate all these lenses for you. Yeah? Uh, yeah, the question is, we see him modify, uh, but it's actually copy. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, the modify will not modify the actual object. It will turn a copy of the object with the street name changed. Very good point. Never noticed that myself, actually. <laughs> um, so Arrow can just generate all these lenses for you. We just have to add the add optics annotation and supply a companion object. And Kotlin in the companion object, that's where all the static methods and um, values get stored. And it will just add those to the companion object as static values. So after we did this, we can now just to go to the person class, to the static city property, to the static street property, to the static name property, and just call the modify on that. So if you use a lot of immutable data, deeply nested data structures, optics, and Arrow can help you with that. Um, it doesn't only have lenses. It also have if you have to do things with lists and such, it has traversals. If you're using sealed classes and only want to go to one end of that, for example, it has prisms. And ISOs can help you deconstruct, as in turn objects into tuples and turn tuples back into objects, if you're interested in that. So what did we learn? A lens is a class that allows us to see and modify a particular attribute of another class. We can compose them to create really powerful lenses, and Arrow can just generate these lenses for you. And lastly, I'm going to talk about smart types. And for that, we start by taking a bit of a look back at how we solved our divide problem. We first tried to solve it using runtime exceptions. Then we tried to solve it using the Cotter's Nullability System. And then we ended up solving it using an either. But there is actually another way to solve this problem and basically prevent this problem from ever occurring. And it's really simple. We just add a bit of Javadoc where we say that B, B just shouldn't be null. And now it's basically the person calling me, uh, calling me's problem. Because, yeah, you should, couldn't, shouldn't call me if B is zero. So do that if check. And that's basically all we have to do. Now we don't have to solve a problem because there is no problem. Of course, people still need to read Javadoc for that. And that's not going to happen realistically. So one thing we could do is, for example, create a class positive and have it a value and in its well, constructor check if it's greater than zero and make B a positive. And now it's impossible to call this function with a negative value. There are however two problems with it. Can someone spot it? Uh, well, neg what will happen if I put in a negative value? I will get back a runtime exception because the check will fail. So. We have first have some object overhead that we now have a wrapper around the value, but we're also back to a runtime exception. To be fair, this runtime exception happens earlier in our process. So in a way, that is an improvement, but it would kind of be cool if you wouldn't have that runtime exception. The object overhead is actually solved quite easily. Um, Kotlin has something that's called value classes. And by making something a value class, uh, at compile time, it's considered a class. But at runtime, it removed the class and just used the double value. 
So you have all the advantages of having a class in checks wise in compile time, but at runtime, the whole class wrapper just won't exist. It will just use the double instead. See people looking a bit uh, confused. <laughs> so this is basically made to uh, add patterns, easily add patterns like this, uh, because we're actually in only interested in the double value, but we want to add extra compile time checks and such. And that's why you have this, so you have the best of both worlds. And to solve the uh, runtime exception, all we kind of need to do is add the error analysis plugin, which is a Gradle plugin that when we try to create a positive with the value minus one, which is not possible, the moment we uh, press compile, we suddenly see an exception that, hey, that value is supposed to be greater than zero, and you're putting minus one in it. That's not allowed. So our runtime exception automatically became a, compil a compile time exception just by adding a greater plugin. Yeah? Um, how is this possible? I could, for example, in a running um, application, maybe I would read the value from a database so I yeah, so what if you don't know, uh, because it's, uh, I put a minus one here, but if you don't know that, I'll get back to that in a few seconds. <laughs> so what's the error analysis plugin? Um, it's a plugin that allows you to add preconditions and post conditions to functions, and mostly regarding numbers and strings. So it basically adds information to the compiler that this value should be greater than zero or afterwards this value is going to be greater than one. And then it has a bit, behaves a bit like Cotton's nullability system where it forces you to make sure these conditions are met. For example, by doing if check. Uh, it's also there on collections and one of the downside is it only supports Gradle, at least for now. So what does the pre and post conditions look like? Um, I use require here. Uh, that's exactly the same as pre. It also supports pre, but then that's because they start when they started this project, require didn't exist yet, and Kotlin added that at the later point, and they just to decided to support both. So in our functions, we require x to be greater than zero. So we add information to the compiler. I want this. Uh, I want this condition to be there. And in the end, we can add a post condition that after calling this function the variable will guaranteed be greater than one. And if we have those pre and post conditions in place, now if I try to call full with zero, hey, the compiler knows it should be greater than zero, so I won't allow you to compile that. If you pass it a value, like you said, um, you haven't proven to the compiler yet that value is greater than zero. So uh, until you prove that to the compiler, it just won't compile. And only if we actually do an if check, the compiler now knows that the value is greater than zero, and now it will allow you to compile the code. Out of it comes an integer, which had a post condition that it's greater than one. And that's why we can call foo again, given that thing, because it knows through the post condition that it's greater than one, which means it's greater than zero, so it will allow that to happen. So it's a very powerful thing we have here. Of course, adding these pre and post conditions is a bit cubism. Um, so instead, I like to use classes for that, like the positive class, and just have like positive in and positive out. And this way, you get exactly the same benefits with without adding pre and post conditions everywhere to your code. It doesn't only work on uh, integers or numbers. It also works on strings. So for example, uh, if you want to have a stri string with maximum length of 10, we can now enforce that using pre and post conditions. That it's now impossible to make a string that's longer than that. And if you get it as value, we now have to prove to the compiler that that's the, that that's the case. Otherwise, it will not compile your program. Collections. For example, if we want to get the first element out of a collection, and the collection is empty, it will crash. So the error analysis plugin won't allow you to write this until you actually check that there are elements in your collection. 
And this doesn't go for first. If you want to do it by index, you first have to do a check if that index actually exists, or else your comp code will not compile. In a way, I also put it, why does this work? Since previously we made our own types, but now apparently Kotlin's list suddenly has this magic added. And that's because it also contains laws. And with laws, you can add these pre and post conditions to existing code. So the arrow team added it to Kotlin's collections. And we see an example for here, where for the first function in the list, we now add pre and post conditions. So Kotlin did that all for you for the Kotlin's collection of the arrow team did it all for Kotlin's collections. But if you have some software of your own, you can add, just add pre and post conditions to that using these laws. So the good parts of this, um, there are also some bad parts coming up. Uh, you can add constraints to your database, uh, to your domain model. Like the string length and such your database might have certain restrictions that this field can only be 10 characters long. It's really nice if you can actually model this like this in your domain model. Or uh, external service might have certain restrictions. As in, you can model all your business logic in your domain model, and it enforces you that these conditions will be met. Basically, it makes sure that illegal states are no longer presentable. And that's something uh, I really like to strive towards. Of course, there's also some bad parts. Um, it's still in the kind of in development, so right now it's somewhat limited. It works on integer on numbers, it works on strings, but only the length of the string. It still doesn't work with the contains of the string, but they're working on that. And it works on collections, but so yeah, it still needs some development there. Also, sometimes it works a bit too well. It's very strict. Anywhere you have a precondition, it must be met under all conditions, even in tests and such. So, yeah, I did uh, at some point got a bit annoyed and, yeah, why won't my code compile and just trust me on this one? Uh, you can opt out, but then you're adding um, this plugin specific code to your code, and I didn't really like to do that. But, yeah, that's it says it uh, checks things for you, and it really checks things for you. And sometimes that's not what you want. It also doesn't really work well with deserialization, because that actually doesn't use the constructor that uses reflection magic underneath, and this plugin doesn't really know how to deal with that. So if you're using Jackson or Hibernate, this won't work. So adding these things to your database entities, unfortunately, doesn't work. So they're domain model only. And it doesn't really support streaming API that well. Um, because if you, for example, do a filter that checks if numbers are greater than zero, make creating in a positive is in a completely different scope. So the information of this doesn't, uh, doesn't get saved. So the error compiler won't allow you to create a positive because for it, it doesn't, you haven't proven to it that uh, it's greater than zero. So you have to use map not now. So there are some disadvantages to it. Um, they're still working out kinks in that, but the idea behind it is actually really awesome because we can now move all kinds of runtime exceptions to compile time exceptions and basically make illegal states not representable. And since I needed a cake metaphor, I wanted to say this, I would say this is the cherry on top of the cake. So concluding, um, Thanks to arrow, we can have both error context and an error type as a return type, thanks to either's. We can have both compiler support and readability thanks to the monad comprehension. We can both have immutability and ease of change thanks to error optics. And we can move runtime exceptions to compile time exceptions thanks to the error analysis plugin. So I think we can conclude that thanks to arrow, we can have our cake and eat it too. Thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions about this, either ask me now, ask me later at this conference, add me on Twitter, it's open for DMs. Uh, if you want the slides, there's a link to that. And uh, I hope you have a great conference afterwards. Thank you so much for your attention.
Ça marche ouais, Ça marche. Do you think there is some overlap between the syntax, uh, Kotlin contrast syntax and uh, a row? Do you know there is the, the contract syntax where you can say uh, the, the same kind as a uh, law? In fact, you can say uh, require uh, uh, not zero, something like this, yeah. and then the compiler is uh, checking it at uh, static time. So uh, it makes me uh, think about a uh, row for this. Do you think there is some overlap or uh, some case where you need to choose one or choose the other? Um, sorry, didn't really get that. S sorry, my, my English is not so good. Uh, do you know the, the Kotlin contract syntax? Uh, the Kotlin contract syntax, uh, apart from require, I have I read about it, didn't really use that yet. Yeah. So I Maybe it's really. experimental. I don't know if it's still, but uh, it was me. But if that would do the same thing, I wouldn't be surprised that I actually talked to the guy maintaining error analysis and he's very passionate about it. So I think the moment that might come out of experimental and he can find a way to use it, he will use it. Also, right now, these are compilation errors, as in uh, mo uh, the moment you press compile, you will get the errors uh, from Gradle. He's also working on support for IntelliJ that you actually get red circles around your code, uh, underneath your code, if you're making uh, a mistake according to that. Other questions? Thank you very much. Okay, no, thank you. No.